today we talked about uh, evergreen perennials. So I'll begin by trying to explain what an evergreen perennial is because as with anything, humans trying to classify nature doesn't always work. So we have things that are A, green all year. We have things that are green in the winter, but then go dormant in the summer. So are they evergreen or just are they winter green? Then we have things, are they a perennial or not? Because that line between perennials and shrubs is really blurred. So uh, some of the things I'll show you today, they're evergreen, but you can argue either side of where they're perennials. So let's just start looking at a few. Uh, a plant that I like to use, and the reason we use perennials, the reason we use evergreen perennials, is so the garden has interest in winter. Because anybody can do a garden that looks good in spring. That takes no ability whatsoever, garden-wise. I mean, it, it doesn't. It's, it's really simple. Wintertime is when you really have to know the plants and find things that are of green interest then. So one of my favorite plants is this. This is a plant called butcher's broom, or ruscus. It's a European native. Uh, it has generally uh, male or female. We do have several, and I'll show you some as we walk through, that have both male and female. And when they do, they have red berries on it all winter. This is probably the most shade tolerant plant that exists. You could grow this under a deck. There's not many plants that will grow where that grows. Love the ruscus. I mean, this is also first cousin to a plant many of you may know called poet's laurel or Dana used in flower rings, another that I would call an evergreen perennial. This is actually, a, the closest plant to this is asparagus that we eat. <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, it's, it's basically an evergreen type of asparagus. When the new shoots come up, you can see that they actually look like little asparagus. All right, other plants that we don't normally think of would be Stokes Aster. Stokesia, one of our great native plants that in the wild actually grows with pitcher plants. People don't, don't know that. So it likes it really soggy, but yet will take very dry. So just texturally, I like that very interesting, even though it doesn't have any uh, uh, bloom in the winter months. Now, we talked about things that die down and then come up. In a classic example, hello. <laughs> classic example would be the surprise lilies or lycoris. Uh, there's two types. There's the type that the leaves come up in October and then the type that the leaves come up in February. And so these will actually go dormant in the uh, late spring, early summer, but they look great in the wintertime. So you, even though they're not technically an evergreen perennial, you can certainly use them in the same way that you would. Okay. Another really great favorite, and this is a particularly dwarf one, these are called sarcococcus. Now, that's one of those you can say, is it a shrub, is it a perennial? I call them perennials. This is actually first cousin to boxwoods. That's the mature size of that. They are just coming into bloom now, and hopefully we'll take you to some that they're in full bloom now. Extremely fragrant. You can find sarcococcus that get three foot tall, you can find them to get one foot tall. But the idea that they are completely evergreen all year and they have wonderful fragrance is really not much like that. And again, for very, uh, uh, very dark shaded areas, absolutely fantastic. Another great one that I think deserves a lot wider use are rhodias. Uh, rhodia is first cousin to a hosta. And again, completely evergreen. Uh, we've just uh, finished harvesting the fruit, but just like the ruscus, it has beautiful red berries that are on it all through the wintertime. And again, very tolerant of shade. It'll take some dry shade, but it really prefers a little moisture to do its best. And the Japanese have been collecting these for years. There's probably 200, 250 named varieties in Japan with all kinds of little funny variegations on them. And obviously, today, we're going to be looking at hellebores. Hellebores are a, sort of probably the, the picture of, of winter perennials because they do have leaves that persist through the winter. Now, we will come on here 
and we cut all the leaves off about a week to two weeks ago. Just because the leaves get tattered in the winter time, we will leave them on long enough to slow them down. What we want is, we don't want them to flower this early. This is way too early. Uh, so we will leave the leaves on. Once the flowers are up above the leaves, there's no point in keeping the leaves on any longer. So then we snip the leaves off for more of a show. And these are all European natives, well, primarily European natives, uh, but just really nice evergreen foliage. think is really particularly nice are the cast iron plants or aspidistras. There are many different types, some hardier than others. Uh, this particular one gets a little bit of winter burn for us, but really nice foliage. And this, you can see, this is a form of aspidistra ladyor that has almost no damage on it. Excuse me, and again, for dry shade, just absolutely fantastic plant. Now, a plant many people may not know or may not recognize is this. Looks like a grass. Is that the neck no. That's also an aspidistra. Yeah. Doesn't look anything like the plant behind you, but yet it is. And this is really interesting how nature has plants that look like something else. So take a look at that and then look at that plant over there. They look just alike, don't they? That little grassy plant over there, almost identical. Okay, that's an aspidistra, that's an orchid. That's actually a hardy cymbidium orchid, which are absolutely amazing. If you see those for sale, we offer them occasionally, not every year. These actually flower in another couple weeks. They're actually in bud now. That's a cymbidium called Geringias, the only hardy cymbidium orchid. So there's a lot of things to give you this wonderful effect from the aspidistras, the orchids, or some of the uh, little carex grasses. Another group that is really nice that I think deserves a lot wider use are the evergreen bamboos. These are the clumping bamboos. I do not ever encourage anyone to grow the running bamboos, which are incredibly problematic. You'll see a lot of these as you walk through the gardens today. They give you a wonderful textural interest in the garden that is really not available on anything else, especially in the wintertime. Nice little ground cover here would be something like the saxifrage. And this is a, uh, well, it's got a lot of native cousins. This is a Chinese version. Uh, a lot of people grow this as a house plant. They call it strawberry begonia. It's not related to begonias at all. I don't know how it got that name, but beautiful evergreen ground cover. It does spread, but not invasively. This patch has been in for well over 10 years old. Another excellent one for evergreen foliage are the cyclamen. Love the cyclamen. This foliage comes up uh, generally in August and persists through the winter, and it will eventually die down in May, uh, June. So it's beautiful foliage, and they finish flowering. They actually finish flowering around Christmas, and I love the fact that these, once it finishes flowering, the old flowers actually coil up to protect the developing seed. So once that seed is ripe, then it actually unfolds, uncoils like a spring and just shoots the seed. So it's just a fascinating little plant that nature could come up with a neat device like that. 
cyclamen are one of those plants that you want to put where nothing else will grow in the shade. So at the base of a tree that never sees any water, that's where cyclamen thrive. If you put cyclamen in a good garden condition, they will die. Put them where they get summer moisture, they die. So you want them in the absolute worst conditions possible in your garden. That's where they thrive. There are a number of wonderful evergreen ferns. You'll see a fair amount as we walk through today. This is one of my favorite. This is uh, Seabold's Dropterus. This is found named after a famous plant explorer named Von Seabold. Uh, this stays completely evergreen. It's getting a little too much sun now that we took the hedges off. But there are a number, again, texturally, there's really nothing quite like the evergreen ferns. And here's more of the ferns, same genus, the wonderful dropterus. The common, most common one is one called autumn fern, dropterus earthrosorum, which looks fabulous in the wintertime. talked a little about ground covers earlier. I think this is one of the most splendid ground covers there is for the winter time. This is our native toothwort. Uh, the genus, of course, Dentaria, which is Latin for teeth. Uh, and this is a, uh, this is actually in the same family as cabbage that we eat. Even though that seems sort of weird, the flowers, which will come up in about another six weeks, are about a foot tall beautiful light mauvey lavender but you've got this wonderful foliage through the winter and often the leaves have a beautiful purple underneath i think it's just fantastic i'm not sure why this is not grown more extremely easy to grow soils either moist to slightly dry now some more different hellebores we looked earlier this is a really interesting group this is a new group been around probably now about seven, eight years, where they took the Christmas rose and crossed it with the Lenten rose, which was supposedly not possible. And they came up with this whole series of really neat uh, foliage that has this silver modeling. So I think the foliage is even better than the hybridists, which are, are nice, but, but love this color uh, in the winter garden. And there's quite a number of these uh, out right now. Anna's red, Penny's pink, Molly's white. Uh, quite a few different ones. Tony, what did you call the, the ground cover? Uh, this is toothwort or dentaria. D-E-N-T-A-R-I-A. Now if you follow taxonomy real close, they've taken now, they've actually decided that toothwort is no more and they've moved them all into a genus called cardamony. Which I'm not really thrilled about that because one of the plants I hate cardamony is uh, bittercress. So this is actually first cousin to bittercress. But bittercress is a problem weed and an okay. annual. This is not a problem weed and it's a perennial. But you know how those taxonomists are, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. Another really interesting uh, uh, evergreen ground cover, another native, is a Ridgeron pulchellus. It gets looking a little rugged by the end of the year. Here's last year's leaves. We've just cleaned those up. The new growth is already coming out. Fantastic ground cover. Really easy to grow. Doesn't take a lot of sun. And then the flowers are about this tall. They look like, uh, look like purple dandelions. They're really extraordinary. It doesn't seed around, not weedy like dandelions. The Ridgeron Pulchellus, if you haven't tried that, and uh, especially if you like native evergreen ground covers, it's just hard to beat this plant. Earlier we showed you one of the toothworts right over there. Here's a different species of toothwort that comes into bloom early. 
It's another of the great natives. That was one called Diphyla. This is Angostata. So this one is a much smaller plant and doesn't spread nearly as much. Evergreen. Other years, it's uh, it's looking a little rough as this one had by the end of the year. These are carthusians. These are actually first cousin to chrysanthemums. They're basically chrysanthemums for the shade, and they grow this wonderful foliage, and then they flower in right around Halloween. The beautiful stalks of yellow daisies. So I'm on the. Let's see. I think I've already run a couple of minutes over, so I'm going to stop here. If you've got any questions, I'm around. I, I hope this does give you a little idea, though, of, of how much possibilities. We could have a garden of all evergreens if we wanted. There's so many choices here. It, it's really amazing.